This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Hello and welcome into another episode of Three Ma. I am John Kurtz, joined by Derek Young from K State Online and Cole Manbeck. Today we are breaking down the second half, the back half of the K State football schedule as we get you ready for game week, which is just around the corner, and I cannot freaking wait for that. Uh, you might be so excited that it's time for a drink. And if you are going to do that, make sure that it is from Holiday Distillery. They've got 360 Vodka. They have Ben Holiday bottled in Bond Bourbon. We have heard rave reviews of both. Uh, go get stocked up. Tailgate season is just around the corner, people. I don't need to tell you, we are just over a week out here now at this point. Okay, You do not have much time. So go get the 360 Vodka so everybody is happy on Saturday when K-State gears up to play SEMO or Ben Holiday Bottle in Bond Bourbon, whatever your crowd is going to be. They're great K-State folks who support us here on the pod, so please support them as well. Uh, also, would like to remind you to head on over to our Patreon page. If you want more 3 Ma content than what we're just putting out here, you can get it at patreon.com slash 3 Ma. Patreon.com slash 3 Ma is how you can find that. We've got pods up about K-State's recent basketball games that they played in Israel and Abu Dhabi, and uh, a lot of rave reviews coming out of that. K-State looked pretty salty. Uh, a lot of really good individual pieces. Uh, I think that you can you can see very easily from there, but we'll break it all down for you. I'm probably giving you too much. I need to make sure that you go over to patreon.com slash 3 to get that. We'll also have a feature up that'll be basically a group chat here pretty soon where you can talk with us, interact with us. You'll get Brody updates. Uh, more bonus pods as they happen, breaking news. Uh, we're going to do some live uh, streams there after games so that you'll be able to interact with us and react to K-State football games as well. Uh, make sure you're a part of that. Just five bucks a month, uh, patreon.com slash 3 All right, back half of the schedule. Let's see if we can make this one uh, quicker than 50 minutes. Uh, you know, if you guys were timing the last one, that was that came in a little little long, a little hot there, but we've got, We've got the meat of the Big 12 schedule coming up here, so I don't know, man. This is going to be a tough stretch. We start with Saturday, October 21st. And by the way, I guess I should frame it like this. We have K-State at 5-1. and one. Everybody has K-State at 5-1 and one through the first half of the schedule. Home game with TCU. Uh, Horn Frogs ranked 17th preseason. Rematch of a couple of great games last year, first in Fort Worth. K-State dealt with the injuries. That was the uh, unveiling of the new Will Howard in Fort Worth, but K-State just didn't have enough to hang on after he got knocked out of the game a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, the Big 12 championship game, an epic battle that K-State won in overtime. I, for whatever reason, I feel pretty good about this one. I don't know. I mean, this has turned into such a chippy uh, sort of mini rivalry between the two teams and the fan bases and everything. I think this will be a game that is circled for a lot of people. I think K-State still, even though they won the Big 12 championship game, hold some frustration for how things went down in Fort Worth. I think that was a game they really felt like they probably should have won and uh, let slip away because of a variety of factors there. TCU, I mean, I, I hate to be a broken record, but to me, so much of it comes down to quarterback. Like Chandler Morris, is he really going to be that dude? They have a lot of talent incoming from the portal. It feels like they're kind of a, uh, they're taking the Bama rejects and pumping them back through their system, which is a pretty good strategy. If you want some talent, uh, they, they had a really nice portal class. So I don't know. I think K-State wins the game. Uh, I think it will be pretty competitive, but I actually feel this is one of the games I feel more confident about, I think, in the conference. I did too, uh, for multiple reasons. I think you kind of hit on the first one that I wanted maybe to dive more head first in on, and that is the quarterback play. I think TCU is going to get remarkably lesser quarterback play. I think the Look, he went to New York and was a Heisman finalist. That's Max Duggan, but he probably still, maybe in Big 12 circles, didn't get enough respect. There were times where people wanted to lodge Jalen Daniels more than Max Duggan, I felt like. And and quite honestly, I, I just don't think we gave Max Duggan probably his due last year. And I think a drop down in quarterback performance is pretty understandable based on what he was able to accomplish a year ago. And with Chandler Morris, look, we mentioned this about Alan Bowman. We mentioned this about Tyler Shuck. But durability is a question for him, too, in terms of how much he actually wants to run and what he's actually able to do from a mobile standpoint. And you just have some questions about that. I have some questions about the transfers. Look, there, it, it could very well work. It's not like there is a shortage of talent, but the more proven way of transfer portal hunting is getting guys that were productive at the Power 5 level or were productive even at a Group of 5 or FCS level. Getting guys that were not productive in a prior stop, sometimes it works, but there's also more of a track record where it doesn't 
And TCU is a lot of guys that kind of have that uh, resume on their table. So I kind of question that. This is also going probably to be the first elite environment and when it comes to a crowd in Manhattan this year. Uh, I think they're going to sell out every game, and, and the other games will be good, great as well. But when you're talking about like hype and build up and just noise level and anticipation, this will be the first one of its kind uh, for this particular season at Kansas State. So I just don't think they let that fall through the grips. I think I, I could see a 10-point win. Let's not forget that Sonny Dykes kind of lucked into the Max Duggan stuff last year. He actually had Chandler Morris start the first game against Colorado, named him the starting quarterback over Duggan, an injury led to Duggan getting the job and then taking it from there, and he obviously shined. So Dykes deserves some credit, but obviously an immense amount of credit to Duggan for what he became for that TCU team. Look, this is a TCU team, first seven games, pretty light on the schedule. They have a 60% chance or higher, according to Kelly Ford, to win each of their first seven games. There's a very good chance, guys, that TCU comes into Manhattan ranked in the top 10 in the country uh, at a 7-0 and record, and they'll be one of the most overrated teams in the country if they do that. Do that. You know, Bill Connolly ranks TCU 21st in the SP+. Plus. He has their offense number 18, their defense number 43. It's a bit surprising to me on their offense just because of how much they lost. You talked about it, D.Y. They returned 41% of their overall offensive production. That ranks 120th out of 131 FBS teams. Five skill position guys had 500 yards or more last year, including Kendra Miller, Quentin Johnston, and others. All five guys are gone. They're missing a lot of dudes that they had, including obviously at the quarterback position. And on the defensive side of the football, their best pass rusher is Dylan Horton. D. Winners are gone. Their star corner, um, one who won the award for, for number one corner in college football last year. And I don't know why I'm blanking on the name because Terrence Newman, one I believe. Tomlinson. Yeah, Hodges Tomlinson. Yeah, I, I was blanking on the name of the award. He is gone. Offensive coordinator. Thorvor. Thorvor. Yeah, gosh, I'm sorry. Um, offensive coordinator Garrett Riley's gone, which uh, some controversy are obviously around the hire of Kendall Bryles. Yeah, wait, 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 man. They, what's the last name of that guy that they hired? The Riley. Yes. And I will say, if you kind of don't like, I'm, he's a good offensive coordinator, a little bit overrated. As an offense coordinator. That Arkansas offense wasn't really anything special last year with Bryle. So I, I agree with you. I think he's a little bit overrated. I'll just tell you, I mean, look, Kelly Ford projects K-State as a two and a half point favorite in this game. No, no I'm, I really respect Kelly Ford and the work he does. K-State's going to win this game 41 to 17. They're going to blow out Ooh. TCU. TCU is a fraud. Um, this team is going to be one of the most overrated teams in college football this year. K-State will blow them out. It'll be similar to the Oklahoma State game in Manhattan last year where an overrated team comes in and the Wildcats slam the door off. It would not stun me. I I kind of like that. And you alluded to it because I wanted to bring it up too and actually forgot. We talked about it with Oklahoma State, maybe with UCF, probably not with Texas Tech just because they have some games. But this is another team that Kansas State could face who hasn't yet lost. You're, you're facing some teams so that I guess Kansas State, the way their schedule is falling, is that they're going to be the first test for many teams, even deep into the schedule. I mean, this game is on October 21st, and we're saying TCU could be undefeated. That's because their four Big 12 games prior to playing Kansas State are against Houston, West Virginia, Iowa State, and BYU. Famous alum. Famous alum for TCU. Any guesses? No, I would only take the obvious one scott brooks scott brooks former uh oklahoma city thunder and washington wizards head coach scott brooks I i'll be honest underwhelming list of famous alums from tcu i was expecting more now i get it's like a smaller private school but i i thought they would have more outside of the sports world like they've got you know oh, I got one. Uh, ladaney and tomlinson like they've got some cool ones in the sports world but outside of the sports world eh. i got one in the sports world that you didn't mention alex delton Damn it. That was a good one. That should have been my answer. You did my job better than I did, Derek. Uh, thank you for that. Yes. I am I am blocked by Alex Elton on Twitter as a fun fact, and I don't really know why. But well, speaking of uh speaking of Mr. Bryles that got hired as the offensive coordinator there, Alex Delton uh got angry at me on Twitter for um being upset about Bryles being hired at, at TCU. So you know, sticking up for sticking up for his school. Something to be said about that, I suppose. Uh, Houston, coming up next, October 28th. That is a home game. Uh, Dana Holgerson rolls back into town. I, I, for one, look forward to the case of sugar-free Red Bull being back on the sideline. I, I have an affinity for Dana Holgerson. 
the zany hair, being a Mike Leach guy, the sugar-free Red Bull thing, the the mythology of that. That doesn't mean I think he's a great coach necessarily, but I just think he's a fun personality and, and good for the sport. I mean, look, I don't think Houston's going to be particularly great this year. I, I think K-State wins the game by two touchdowns, 14 to 17. Um, no, no real worry for me on this. I mean, I can tell you that Houston has Donovan Smith playing quarterback now who – uh, was at Texas Tech in split time at, at QB last year. So, I mean, that's, you know, it's a nice start. They were okay last year, pretty good two years ago. But Houston fans, here's how I gauge this. The work that I do on YouTube with the Houston fans that I have, like, they, they seem to hate Dana Holgerson. Like, I don't, nobody seems excited or enthused about him bringing them into the conference. And he did have that quote back around signing day where he basically was saying there was a, a warning shot to everybody within their program and the donors and everybody saying, like, I know what it's like to coach in the Big 12 and like our facilities and everything. Like we're not, we're not there. We're not ready for it. We better prepare ourselves. So that didn't give me a ton of confidence that he feels like Houston's going to be ready to roll. I would agree. My only reservations about this game, and I, I'm sure Cole will allude to it as well, because he likes to look at these things as just where it positions itself on the schedule. Now, take away the caliber of opponent, be damned, I guess. Uh, this place as well as it the trap game of the ske- of the season for Kansas State. Like, if you wanted to look at the schedule and say, where's your Tulane loss or where's your Arkansas State loss, like the inexcusable one that you pull your hair out and say, how the hell did that happen? It's Houston because it's right after what you could perceive as perhaps a gauntlet just based on the opponent records with Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, and TCU, all three teams that at the time that Kansas State plays them will likely be ranked. Then you play Houston at home which will probably have a losing record, who probably just got their ass kicked the week before by Texas. And the next week, Kansas State plays their biggest game of the season when they play the Longhorns in Austin. It's like that let down look ahead sandwich that the solid verbal loves to allude to and uh, trademark as well. So I think Kansas State needs to be mindful of just how this game is positioned because it is easy. This one is the easiest game on the schedule to overlook, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Well, so that even the non-conference game. So I would say Kansas State should win this game, like 41-10. to 10. I doubt that happens. I'll say 31-17. Yeah, man, I definitely think that, that's actually a point I hadn't even thought about, D.Y., on where this game falls in the schedule. It's a really good point. It's valid. Uh, I'll try to keep this to a minute and under on Houston because I think K-State does end up winning this game in controllable fashion. But it's a Houston team where defense really was the key to last year's struggles and failures. You know, it was a team that was 33rd in the SP Plus the year prior, and then last year they fall to 99th in the country in the SP Plus. They were 89th in defensive success rate, 123rd in three and out rate, 124th out of 131 FPS teams in tackle success rate, all according to Bill Connolly. They gave up 77 points in a game to SMU. They were ranked 102nd in defensive points per drive allowed. Two of their best pass rushers are now gone. 11 of 20 players with 200-plus snaps are gone on the defense side of the football. You could say, well, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, Clayton Toon threw for 4,000-plus yards last year at the quarterback position. He's gone. Tank Dell, one of the best receivers in college football, over 1,400 yards receiving. He's gone. Two stud offensive linemen in Patrick Paul and Tyler Johnson, an offense that averaged almost three points per drive, ranking 16th in the country last year. But still, I just think the defense and – where this Houston program is at. They're, they're going to struggle this year a little bit. Um, Kelly Ford actually ranks Houston as the worst Big 12 team on K-State's schedule, uh, and uh, they're 100th in the country in overall returning production. I think K-State wins this game 52-27. Uh, to 27. Yeah, I would agree with it being the worst Big 12 team on the schedule, but just for the reasons that I already alluded to, I, I just doubt it plays like that on the field. It'll be one of those games where you just have kind of a yucky feeling after even an old. Well, when that happens, I will feel bad for famous and very notable Houston alum that I'm sure Cole has heard of, Paul Wall. I will feel bad for Paul Wall, uh, who will have to console himself with his grills. Of course, the uh, be looking huge, the track. huge track with uh, Nelly. Did you ever hear the the song Grills with Nelly, Cole? Uh, I, I don't know, John. I, I was going to make a joke that Paul Wall, Wall was a rapper, but I thought that name didn't sound like a rapper, so I thought I was going to make a joke, and it turns out he actually is. So um, I did, I, you know I don't know anything about music. So I never heard of it. I thought Derek was about to chime in with a Paul Wall take there. I'm sorry. I was giving D.Y. some space. 
No, I, I got nothing. That that was just, like the okay. I've learned my lesson. Funny story from back in the radio show days. I learned long ago. Now Dy just he seemed like he was perked up with Paul Wall, so I thought he had something here. But in the radio days, I remember doing a segment one time where Britney Spears was like the bumper music, and Dy was coming on, and I threw it to Dy for like a Britney Spears take. Now this is on the radio, so I couldn't see him, and I threw it to Dy for the Britney Spears take, and he just went completely silent on me and didn't say anything. It was like, uh, yeah, okay. And I was like, hey, I learned my lesson. Do not give Derek pop culture references to talk about. So that What's was my point? For perspective, I do that just about on any topic that is of no interest of me. So like if I'm in a conversation with Cole and John and I go silent, they, they know because I literally am not invested in the conversation, nor will I even pretend or give a facade that I am. I do remember Paul Wall. He was like in the days of like Mike Jones and all them. Yeah, yeah. That Houston rap scene, man, it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh he worked a lot with Chameleon Air. We remember Riding Dirty by Chameleon Air. Yeah. Well, Cole, Riding Dirty by Chameleon Air. Nothing. Hook him. Is oh. Riding is is Riding Dirty the song they used to play with Ron Prince? They see me roll in, they hate him. Song. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That just I don't like that song because it played during the Ron Prince era so much and it okay. facilitates bad memories. Well, at least we we hit on something. We found yeah. something. Uh, I'm sure Homefield is just thrilled with this content leading into their their read here. Um, Paul Wall probably has some Houston Homefield gear. I mean, I'm sure he could he could get that done. Um, but you should be in your K State Homefield gear. Homefieldapparel.com is where you can find it. They have two new K State drops that look awesome. It's retro gear, lots of retro logos. So if you are somebody that's into that at all, this is the place to go. Incredibly comfortable as well. Very high quality. We all have a closet full of home field gear, and that's that's basically all that I wear to to games when I'm going to K State games. It is I'm pretty much decked out in uh, in home field. So make sure that you get there. You, we even have a discount code for you if it's your first time buying three mod twenty three for fifteen percent off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. And uh, if you do want to venture out to hundred plus other schools, they have all of that there as well. Constantly adding new stuff uh, to the lineup. So homefieldapparel.com for that, and we'll get to the rest of the schedule next. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Okay, well, now we come to uh, a really interesting spot in the schedule. Saturday, November 4th, traveling to Austin for the last time before the Horns go to the SEC. And this has not been a good spot for K-State. K-State has been a more successful program than Texas, winning a couple of Big 12 championships since the last time the Longhorns did 13 years ago. However, uh, K-State has not beaten Texas since 2016. So will that end here with K-State sending the Longhorns out the door in a year where Texas is much hyped, being talked about as a potential playoff team, the general favorite to win the league, tons of talent as always, but... I have said this over, I've been consistent with this throughout the offseason. It is dumb to bet Texas to win the Big 12, based on what we have seen now for almost a decade and a half, in the same way that it is dumb to bet anybody other than Kansas to win the Big 12 in basketball. We've seen too much data over the last couple of decades to feel good about doing that, so I, I will not do that for Texas. I feel like they will find ways to trip up. The question to me is, will it actually be this game against K-State in Austin? Um, because much like the Stillwater thing, I'm a little bit scarred by how some things have gone lately in Austin. I mean, the last couple of games there, 19 and 21, I feel like K-State should have won both of those games and uh, found a way to trip up and lose. Yeah, the, there was the the COVID year game, or uh, then the game where Roshan Johnson was the starting quarterback for Texas as well. So there's been, uh, that was like the Wildcat versus Wildcat offense in that one. Uh, these games have not been, they've been sore on the eyes. I don't think this one will be. I think this will be an electrifying game. It might be Big Noon on Fox. It wouldn't shock me if that's the case, that both of these teams are what we perceive them to be at this point. Obviously, Kurtz has uh, some trepidation on Texas still for, probably for you know the right reasons, obviously, just because of what we know about the Longhorns. I think Texas is going to be really good. I think Kansas State's going to be pretty good. If we know anything about Chris Kleiman at Kansas State, the game that you would typically see a team uh, circle on a schedule, they've won that game. Uh, often that's been Oklahoma, right, for the Wildcats. Beat the Sooners three out of the last four times. Rough luck lately against Texas. This is the last chance to Chris Kleiman has to beat them. This is the only team in the Big 12, I believe, of the – 
remaining nine other members that are eight members, nine members, that they have not beat. I think they get it done. The, usually when they circle a game on a schedule that you would think that they'd probably circle on a schedule, they win it. Whether that's Oklahoma, I think this year that's Texas, they're due. Chris Kleiman will not see this series end without a win. I think this is the one that Kansas State gets up for and gets done because they have a, they have a, a knack for rising to the occasion in these types of games since he was hired in Manhattan. Love it, D.Y. That's an aggressive pick. Uh, I hope that comes to fruition. John, your thoughts on Quinn Ewers being number three favorite, according to DraftKings, for the Heisman Trophy, a plus 1,300 odds. Third best odds in the country. He's probably going to roll his eyes. Yeah. And nobody watched uh, 19 of 49 at uh, Oklahoma State last year. I I don't know, man. I mean, I'm sure he's going to get better. Um, but I, I, Quinn Ewers was not very good last year. I mean, one of the most annoying narratives to me was like, oh, well, you know, if Ewers wouldn't have gotten knocked out of the Alabama game. I don't, I'm not so sure they were better off. Like, I don't, if you watched Ewers play most of the year. I mean, they, Sark screwed the pooch by just not giving Bijan the ball enough in some key games. And I mean, look, like, look at the TCU game. And what was Texas's offense doing against TCU? And Quinn Ewers wasn't good enough to, to step up and win that. Like, they've got a lot of talent there. Ewers has a ton of arm talent, but I don't, They've, just, they've still got to ditch this whole like soft kind of country club program thing to be able to grind out games that they need to win to win league titles. So, I mean, that's that's still my... Now, having said all that, I would pick K-State to lose here. I would pick K-State to lose here. Uh, I don't I don't feel good about this one because I think Texas will be up for it. I think they'll look at it as defending Big 12 champs um, and uh, they're, they're going to want that game. It's probably the toughest stretch of the schedule for Texas, too. Now, it's not, it, Kansas State's not in the middle of that. It's in the beginning. Three of their last four games are against K State, TCU, and Tech. Well, and we've got K State at seven and one going into this game. If that comes to fruition, then you know that you're talking about a top fifteen matchup in Austin, big game. Let me give you guys some numbers real quick. So Texas preseason favorite to win the Big Twelve according to DraftKings, actually plus one hundred odds to win the conference championship. So a pretty heavy favorite. K State's actually got the third best odds at plus five hundred, I believe. According to DraftKings, Oklahoma's at plus 350 um, to win the league. I mentioned Ewers, plus 1,300 odds to win the Heisman. That's the third best in the country. Texas is number nine overall in the ESPN SP Plus rankings heading into the year. They rank number 11 on offense, 16th on defense. Kelly Ford ranks the Horns number six nationally in his power ratings. Texas returns 73% of its overall production. That ranks 15th best in college football, but they return 85% of their offensive production, guys. That's the third best mark in the entire country. Might surprise you a little bit because B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson are gone. Those two accounted for more than 2,100 of Texas's 2,400 rushing yards, so about 88% of their rushing yards is now gone as both those running backs are in the NFL. Uh, this is a, you know, mentioned Quinn Ewers. He ranked 97th, this is according to Bill Connolly, 97th in raw QBR in the fourth quarters of last season, 104th on third downs. Texas outscored teams by 179 points in the first three quarters last year, but was outscored by 12 in the fourth quarter in overtime. And I mention that because the biggest problem for Texas has been in the Steve Sarkeesian era, the two seasons there, they're 9-2 and two in games decided by multiple scores, according to Bill Connolly. They're 4-10 and 10 in one-score games, all five losses last year came by seven points or less. So the inability to close out close games has been a problem. The defense got better last year significantly. They moved from 106 to 15th in the SP+. Plus. Uh, and just real quick again on the offense, we talked about how much talent they have returning. Tons of weapons at tight end and the receiver position. Xavier Worthy, Jordan Whittington, tight end Jatavion Sanders, and Isaiah Nayer, wide receiver transfer from Wyoming who missed last season due to a knee injury. They're all back. You know, Sanders, Whittington, and Worthy combined for 164 receptions last season, 15 touchdowns, over 2,000 yards. And now they get Isaiah Nair back from the knee injury, uh, who had 878 yards receiving in his last season at Wyoming on just 44 receptions and 12 touchdowns. In his two years of college football, he's averaged 22 yards per catch. Um, so big-time player, and then they have a really good offensive line, Texas does. Kelvin Banks, likely an All-American left tackle, allowed one sack last year as a freshman. Talented running backs, uh, even though they lose Bijan and Roshan. So I think Texas probably beats K-State in this game. Kelly Ford gives K-State just a 20% chance. He has Texas projected by 11 and a half. I'm going to take Texas to hand K-State. It's second loss, defeating the Wildcats 38 to 31. Neil deGrasse Tyson, 
famous uh, Texas alum. I was uh, I was debating between him and uh, Gary Gilbert. Couldn't decide which to go with as the uh, the famous Texas alum. But decided to go with Neil deGrasse Tyson there. Uh, Baylor, Baylor, November 11th, returning back home. Uh, we've got K State seven and two now. Is that what it is? Seven and two. Well, you uh, has got them eight and one, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Derek, Derek eight and one. Cole and I seven and two. Uh, as we head down the home stretch in November, hosting Baylor. Another fairly difficult read for me, but ultimately, as much as I love Dave Aranda, and I do, I really like Dave Aranda a lot. Just his general philosophy, kind of the Zen master sort of football coach. I like the vibe. And he had a tremendous year a couple of years ago. But I, if Blake Shapin is really still like, that's the guy that they're rolling with at quarterback, I yeesh, I don't know. I know I've tried to uh, defend him a little bit, I think, to Cole in the past, much to Cole's chagrin. But I kind of out on the Blake Shapin thing. I don't feel great about Baylor really getting back up much past like seven or eight wins and uh with the game being in manhattan i mean case they totally bumped them last year i don't see baylor making up that much ground this year i, I would take k-state to win close close game eh? like a you know 30 to 23 kind of k-state win a minute don't love the quarterback situation but i like the running back situation they do probably the best running back in the league yeah they are a team that if you are not on top of your P's and Q's, they can sting it, I think, still, just because of that coaching staff and because of that running game and because of what I perceive their defense to look like this year as well. You get them after you play Texas just before maybe the one of the more anticipated Sunflower showdowns in recent memory, I would say, perhaps, if KU's doing, taking care of their business just even a little bit. I think this is the one can't stick you get one you shouldn't every year, you lose one you shouldn't every year. I think Kansas State loses a home to Baylor. Woof. Wow. Okay. Wow. I can get them out of left field. Well, well, you just can't take every, them to win like every game they should because when's the last time they did that, right? And you can't take them to lose every game they should because when's the last time they did that, right? You got to have some surprises. That's what a season always provides. If you have little surprises, you're probably not going to get it right. I think they beat Texas, lose to Baylor. I mean, I don't think any of us had K State losing to Tulane last year, to be fair. Like your what, point, DY. Or TCU. You guys thought I was crazy for picking TCU. Yeah. Over. yeah. Um, yeah. Baylor's a hard team to figure out. I, I think we all have a lot of respect for Dave Aranda. We actually, all last year on this same preseason schedule preview pod, picked the Big 12 championship game to be K State versus Baylor. That's what all three of us had. Baylor was the Big 12 defending champions. Um, you know, won their bowl game, their their New Year's Six bowl game. And uh, we expected them to be really good because a lot of them are faith in Aranda, and they took a big step back. Their overwin total is seven at minus 120 odds. According to DraftKings, Kelly Ford gives K-State a 64% chance to win, projects them as a five-point favorite. Baylor is 96th in overall production returning, 88th in offensive production returning at 55%, 80th in defensive production returning at 56%. Connolly has them as the number 30, 34 team in the SP plus ranks them 30th on offense, 52nd in defense. Uh, they're going to run the football a lot. Richard Reese, you guys mentioned it almost a thousand yards last year as a true freshman on 198 carries. Craig Williams also back running back senior 557 yards on the ground on 101 carries. And then they add in leading Oklahoma state running back Dominic Richardson as well. The biggest question for me is quarterback again, Blake Shapin. Um, he was 73rd and quarterback rating last year. And then also can Dave Miranda fix the defense? I've got a new defensive coordinator, Matt Pallage, quill coordinator from Oregon last year, comes over to command the Baylor defense. Baylor fell from number three in the SP plus defensively last year to number 62. They allowed 2.52 points per drive, which ranked hundred in the country. So they got to get better again on the defensive side of the football I do think they'll be better. I, I think I would probably project Baylor to win seven or eight games, but I like this game, even though it's a tough one coming off the, the game at Texas. I think I like K-State to win this one 34 to 24. Also, because I do expect, especially Dave Aranda and his background, I I think they'll be much better. I think they probably took that personally more than anything. Is probably the defensive side of the ball, even more than quarterback play, just because of their background. I think that's what will get fixed first and foremost, if you believe that. Based on every team that Kansas State would be favored on their schedule, Baylor would have the best formula in terms of being an upset team. A good teams for upsets, the two 
generally the two things that they're really good at, if they're not favored and trying to beat a team that is favored, running the ball and playing defense, I think Baylor will have those components. And no idea about this, but Baylor alum Trey Wingo. Did not know that at all. Did not know that at all. Willie Nelson also attended Baylor uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, so, you know, pretty good. Baylor, Baylor got a pretty strong list here, man. I, I like the Baylor list of uh, famous alums. All right, we've got two games left. We each now have K-State at 8-2, and two, heading into at Kansas and Iowa State, two rivalry games to end the season. You know that discussion will be fun, and uh, it's coming up next. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Well, the last time, guys, that uh, K-State lost a football game to Kansas, I believe that was, it was 2008. Was I always get this mixed up. I think George W. Bush was still actually in office at that point in time. He was. Uh, that was before Barack Obama had taken office. So George W. Bush still in office. I think we were on like the iPhone 2, maybe. I think the first iPhone came out in 07. It's been a long time since K-State has lost a football game to Kansas, being the point here. Going to Lawrence, and Kansas feels like this is this is the time when it finally happens, right? They've, they've got Jalen Daniels and company. They had a better year last year. They've announced this new uh, football facility project. Uh, lots of momentum flowing here. They do have a tougher schedule this year. I will say that much. I will be very interested to see where Kansas is actually at by this point in the schedule this year. I think K-State wins a very close game, but I, I mean, I won't, I will not lie for a second. I mean, you guys know I was the one that seemed to have the most uh, respects for Kansas on this show last year, at least their actual football team. Maybe not what I was, you know, saying on Twitter, but I had a lot of respect for Kansas. I think this will be a very, very difficult game at the end of the year. You know, that's going to be juiced up. I, it starts to bring back cold, bad memories of like being there in 2004 uh, remembering what the atmosphere was like for that, still hearing that damn gong going off over and over again is, uh, is it, it was John Randall, right? John Randall making like one-handed catches down the sideline. So I'm not going to lie. I have to fight a little bit of that. I would take K-State very close here, um, but I think this will be an absolute dogfight. I, I will give Kansas that respect. I think this game will be a total, total dogfight. Already shared, but I do believe this will probably end up being the most anticipated Sunflower Showdown in a long, long time, definitely since I've covered the team when on my first day on the Kansas State beat was September 1st, 2017. So that is perspective there. Um, doesn't seem like it's been that long, but I guess it has. I think it'll probably be a competitive game no matter what. I'll come out and say that. And I know people are still saying there's no way. It's impossible. It's Kansas. Well, this isn't the same Kansas. So I do have some level of respect for what Lance Leibold and company have done. And I think to an extent, will continue to do. It's not an easy thing that they are doing. Um, even though the the schedule broke right for them and was a heck of an accomplishment for what they did last year in advance to a bowl game. Um, but this year is a tougher schedule. I don't think it quite breaks for them the same way that it did last year. Uh, I'll be very, very curious what happens in week two when they play Illinois. I think that game actually could tell us quite a bit. I think how close this Sunflower Showdown is could be dependent upon where, as John shared, is at. This is the 11th game of the season. Is Kansas 7 and 4? Are they 5 or 7 and 3? Are they 5 and 5 or are they 4 and 6? I, I think where they are at from a mental standpoint could determine how close this game is. I'll say Kansas State wins by 10 again. Um, could it be closer than that? You betcha, especially if Kansas is sitting there at 5-5, 6-4, 7-3. I'm 100% with you guys on a lot of it is dictated where this KU football team is at at that point in the season, both not only from the mentality of that football team, but also the mentality of KU fans in general, right? Because it can be a much tougher place to play if KU fans actually buy up the tickets and there aren't 10, 15,000 K-State fans in there because KU fans are excited and, and, you know, they actually have that home field advantage, which they haven't necessarily had in the past 15 plus years, um, longer than that when playing Kansas state. So like KU finished six and seven last year, you guys know the story started five and oh, dropped six of the last seven games. Uh, offense was really successful in those first five games and then struggled a little bit at different times in big 12 play. They did finish ninth in the offensive SP plus rankings, 24th in offensive points per drive 
Jalen Daniels back at quarterback. So is the backup Jason Bean, who actually, from a points per drive basis, put up almost a full point per drive better on average than Jalen Daniels did last year. Like one of the things that stands out to me most guys, KU returns 85% of its percent of its overall production. That leads the country. That's overall from a football team perspective, 85% of their entire team back from a productive standpoint. Uh, number one nationally, they return 95, 91% of their offensive production. That's by far and away number one in the country. You could argue that this next one's a bad thing because they return 80% of their defensive production. Uh, which we know the defense was one of the worst in college football last year. That ranks sixth nationally and returning defensive production. They were 123rd in defensive success rate last year, 126th in three and out rate. Um, Brian Worland, the defensive coordinator, is back, but so is Andy Kolonicki, the offensive coordinator, who I think we all agree is a really good coach. Uh, Kelly Ford gives K-State a 71% chance of winning this game, actually projects them as seven and a half point favorites. Uh, One thing I'll mention, guys, and I don't know if I would agree with this or you guys would. uh, And again, I respect Kelly Ford's power ratings and all the analytics driven data that he pulls together. He has KU as a 57% chance to beat BYU in the Big 12 opener in Lawrence. And then the best chance for KU to win any other league game is a 41% chance against Cincinnati on the road. They're less than a 40% chance in any of the other seven league games. So, he actually asked KU um, as a team that could finish 13th in the Big 12 out of 14 teams. I, I think they'll probably go over that. Like I mentioned, their over hour win total is set at six at minus 125 odds, according to DraftKings. I'm going to take K-State to win this game, 45-34. I had it 41-30. I will say, so BYU and maybe not another one like that until Cincinnati. I'm looking in bet- what's in between those two, obviously. Uh, Texas, no. You know, Oklahoma State and Stillwater is tough. You play OU at home. But I think he's, and then you got Texas Tech and K State. I mean, it's a tough schedule, but I think he's probably un- underselling what they can do against UCF and Iowa State. You get UCF at home, we play at, at Iowa State. I w- They're gonna beat. Iowa. They'll beat Iowa State. Yeah. yeah. Iowa State. Like, yeah. I, I think some, and we'll hit on Iowa State next. But I think some of the unknowns is like in these analytic-driven arguments, right? Is who's gonna play for Iowa State due to the betting scandal and everything? Yeah, they're not taking into account that they probably won't have a starting quarterback in Hunter Decker or starting running back in Jirel Brock and whoever else that may not be on the field. Yeah. Um, famous Kansas alum, of course, quarterbacking legend Jordan Webb. Jordan Webb, famous University of Kansas alum. I will never forget being in the student section of what I believe was a 59-7 to K-State win in Lawrence in 2010 on a Thursday night. Kind of came out of nowhere. Um didn't expect that game to be that much of a blowout. The student section cleared out. So your boy was all of a sudden front row at the booth, you know, in the student section. And I picked up this sign that was on the ground and it, it had written in glitter. It was like you know, glitter pen or something. And it said, fear the web for uh, Jordan Webb. And it was like written out like a spider web. So I held that sign proudly from the student section in 2010 as case they uh, kicked the crap out of Turner Gill. So. Shout out to uh, University of Kansas alum Jordan Webb. As we roll now into Iowa State at 9-2, and two, we've all got the Cats at 9-2 and two going into this game. I don't fear Iowa State a bit. Coming into Manhattan, like if, if this were into the year night game in Ames, I, I suppose I could, but I mean, that program does not feel like it's in a good spot. The gambling thing, the quarterback issue. I mean, J.J. Cole, I think, is going to be phenomenally talented, so that that would be my caveat. Like, if they wind up rolling with him at, at QB, he's an Avery Johnson level quarterback that they have waiting in the wings. If by that point in the season he's really developed and is starting to come on, then maybe they become a, a completely different team because I would expect that the defense will still be tough. Um, but man, I mean, I just I don't believe at all in the offense. We'll see if Nathan Shieldhouse is really that guy to to get it completely turned around, but. Especially if in our scenario here, K-State may be at this point playing for a spot in the Big 12 championship game. I don't see it, guys. I, don't, I think Iowa State will continue to uh, to struggle. They have a lot going against them. Like you said, this is well, last year was not a great year. You, you were hoping to bounce back this year. Now you're running in a ro- some more roadblocks and adversity throughout the offseason that really probably stumps the progress and growth and development of your roster because it's impacting guys that you're supposed to be relying on even more this year so it feels like you kind of take a step back and it's just like last year all over again except maybe you're throwing in a true freshman quarterback with a first year play caller I think that's a recipe for disaster as well even if Nathan Shilas ends up being a good OC even if J.J. Cole ends up being a good quarterback 
just a combination of those two together, working together for the first time, their college careers is in their respective roles. I think that's just a lot of, it's asking for a lot of growing pains. So the next question is, does all that, you know, the lumps that they take throughout the season because of those things, because they're going to take a lot of lumps by the time the end of the season gets here, does that make them a better team or are they just worn out and ready to get to the off season and develop for the next year? I think it's probably the latter. I mean, they finish with Texas and K-State. I think the chances for me, what I would project is that they're kind of ready to yell mercy at that point and just get to the next year where they expect to be better. And they, those are lopsided games and they just give wall to both Texas and Kansas State. I think, I think there's a good chance Kansas State wins this game very similar to the way they won the Oklahoma State game last year. John, what are your thoughts on Matt Campbell's uh, record elite elite head coach Matt Campbell's record in one score games. They went one and six in one score games last year and are one and ten in one score games over their last eleven. It's not very good. Should have taken that Jets job. Hmm. Well that Jets job. I, you did I, ever... I chime in with a joke as well. Like how surprising based off his performance in late games is it that Xavier Hutchinson has not been mentioned as part of the gambling schedule. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Big drops. Big drops. Texas and K-State. I think we all remember also the wide open one in Texas that would have given them the lead. And look, that's a big part. Xavier Hudson, you know, three years in Ames at the wide receiver position, over 2,900 yards receiving, over 250 receptions. He's gone. Jalen Noel's back at the wide receiver position, but uh, this is a team that really, really struggled to run the football last year. 3.1 yards per carry, 122nd in the country. I don't think that number is going to improve much. Jarrell Brock uh, has not practiced. It sounds like he's caught up, uh, perhaps in the betting things too. So, uh, Iowa State four and eight last season. Kelly Ford gives K State a seventy four percent chance to win. Has them as a nine point favorite. I w- I would have that number higher, uh, personally, because he has he has Iowa State forty second in his power ratings. Connolly actually has Iowa State up there. I think in the top fifty as well. Uh, they're going to be probably solid defensively again. Defensive coordinator John Hecox back. Um, over the last six seasons, Iowa State's averaged a, a 22 defensive SP plus ranking. Um, last year, they allowed 14 points or less in seven games, but they lost three of them. That's pretty hard to do. They lose Will McDonald, one of the best defensive ends in the country, top 15 draft pick this last year in the NFL draft. Lose a lot on that side of the football. I still think they'll be okay, but offensively, I just can't see them make the jump. I mean, I know they moved on from Tom Manning, an offensive coordinator, but it's an offense that finished 110th last year in SP plus, 107th in yards per play, 104th in yards or points per game, 99th in success rate, 119th in turnover rate. I mean, the numbers are atrocious. So I expect K-State to win this game um, kind of running away. I think they'll win it. I'll take them 38 to 17. I think it'll be similar to Oklahoma State last year, but Iowa State, I don't think they were always like this, but with Matt Campbell at least to begin, but they are definitely like Big 12 Iowa at this point. Just in terms of no no offense, yeah, they like and just boring, and th- they also wear the same colors now. So, they, you're right; they are they are just very very blah across the board. Of course, uh, famous Iowa State alum Seneca Wallace. He is famous for being, I believe, the only man in college football history to throw pick sixes to the same player on back to back possessions. K State's Bobby Walker. In 2002, housed him in uh, the span of three plays. He threw two pick sixes to uh, Bobby Walker, the same K-State State. Of course, what Seneca Wallace's career is marked by and known for. So, famous Iowa State alum there to finish us off. We've got K-State now at 10-2 and uh, at the end of the regular season. Heading into, I, I assume we would have them in the Big 12 championship game in that scenario if they go 10-2? and I will say, what I... I, I'll go ahead and say yes, just for the for the sake of this. What is why wouldn't we say that um, when we have the opportunity to? But if you're seven and two with with there being fourteen teams and imbalanced schedules, seven and two is not a guarantee to get it. You could it be in a tie. You could be in a tie. It could leave you out. Yeah, I don't I don't know how that'll work because I think Oklahoma has a good shot to to be seven and two or better. Um, and you don't play them head to head. So I, I haven't read through all the tiebreaker scenarios. We'll we'll probably have to go through that at some point. Uh yeah. hopefully K State's in a position where we'll, you know, be talking about that at the end of the year. I think it'll definitely come into play because that's what I was thinking. Like, what if Texas is let's just say Texas is eight and one or so in the Big Twelve, and then you got Kansas State and Oklahoma both seven and two. I think that's a very realistic scenario. 
I would agree. So uh, I think like, and I'm even like going through the schedule here. I'm playing to the optimistic side because I think I've kind of been more in like the nine and three sort of range here. So I may just give it to like, look, when I'm individually breaking down these games, it seems like wins, but they would slip up somewhere else along there. I, I have kind of been on that train leaning toward being close, getting back to Arlington, but not quite. That's really my overall feel on where this team is at. But I, I think they they very easily could. You know, one of those games goes a different way. They they could very much be back. If you put a gun to my head, I I, I think Kansas State is the, probably the, the second best team in the Big 12 just because I'm not a believer in Brent Venables as a coach. But schedules matter too. And, you know, Kansas State's never played or never won, you know, back-to-back Big 12 titles. And it's tough to do. Um so I think I would be tempted just in general without breaking it down the way that we did individual by individual to say I can't say narrowly misses out on Arlington. I guess a good maybe one of the final questions to ask is like aside from the two games that you had them losing to, where's that one other game that kind of scares you where you almost took the other team that could that could eventually maybe be the reason why they don't get to Arlington because well, when I it looked at it, State, to me, it was Oklahoma State. It was the one. When I looked at it, because I think they're going to lose at Texas Tech, and I and I said Baylor, and you beat Texas. So, you know, I, I guess there's the the scary gains to me where I think I said yes they'll win, and and at the end of the day, it's like, am I really that confident? It's both the first two Big Twelve games, to be honest, UCF and Oklahoma State. It's not Texas for you. I mean. But then I then because if they if they were to lose to Texas and I think they beat Baylor, that's more of a psychological. Thing. Yeah, I mean it's a great thought question to put into play. I mean I think the UCF game could be very tricky to be honest. Um, I think he said will win it. Yeah, um, UCF and Oklahoma State. But I'm probably going to say Oklahoma State because it's on the road and it's a Friday night, which can get weird. And K State has had their struggles in Stillwater, so I'm going to say that one. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. I mean, look, the the athletic, you know, speaking of tiebreaker scenarios and everything that plays out, the athletic had a piece from Sam Kahn and Justin Williams just over the last week uh, that published. He said that they had an anonymous Big 12 coach that said about Oklahoma, if you look at strength of schedule, Oklahoma might have the easiest schedule in Power 5 football this season. So, yeah, um, I they think they play, lose. They don't, they don't play a non-conference Power 5 team either. Yeah, I think they lose to Texas, but I don't know where the second loss comes from. I think you probably trust in Brent Venables to choke one away, maybe two, maybe three. I don't know. Um, and then I, I thought it was really interesting, guys. In the athletic, the same anonymous Big 12 coach said about K-State, I like Kansas State. They have their whole offensive line back. They have, they do have people they have to replace, but Climate has a phenomenal culture. He's won at a high level winning national championships. This is the part that really I think is impressive. Uh, quote, if you take the logos off the helmet and look at the roster, the teams, and the culture in the Big 12, I'm taking K-State this year. Um, so I thought that was an interesting quote. And they actually, in the athletic, they have three teams in the Big 12 in Tier 1 this year. It's Oklahoma, K-State, and Texas. Um, and Kelly Ford has K-State as a 50% chance to win in 10 or more, 10 of their games this year. Only three teams in the Big 12 have those types of odds individually looking at game by game basis it's Oklahoma K-State and Texas so a lot of analytics out there and numbers that would tell you that K-State is probably at the very least a top three team in this league Brian Freemau who I really respect his FEI ratings just came out preseason he has K-State as a number 11 team in college football he has Texas at number nine he has K-State as the the number two team in the big 12 Oklahoma and TCU behind them at the end of the day I do think kids they might need a little help in terms of someone beating Oklahoma like I really feel that way. Let's say they lose to Texas. The only green, I don't think they're losing a home to UCF or Iowa State or at Cincinnati or a home against West Virginia or at BYU. So it's like that next three games. Could could they lose in Lawrence? Maybe. Uh, Bedlam would I would circle still because that's the last one of its kind and it's in Stillwater. So that's interesting. And they finished the year at home against TCU. I think you have to keep in mind Dylan Gabriel's been very injury prone. Now they have a much better talented backup quarterback to go to this year than they did last year with Jackson Arnold, true freshman, five star QB coming in. But if if Dylan Gabriel gets injured, this thing could it could go a little bit different direction for for Manables and the Sears. Yeah, there would be a level of irony though, for especially for Kansas fans that were but you know, kind of the ones that were a little bit 
delusional and in denial about Kansas State winning the Big 12 last year is because they said TCU had a better record and, and went to the playoff that it what with Kansas were to defeat Oklahoma at home, and that's kind of what catapulted Kansas State back to Arlington. That would be interesting. Yeah, D.Y., I, I think UCF's going to be the team to beat Oklahoma and Norman. That's what I'm going to go with my bold prediction right now. And uh, I didn't say it yet, but I have K-State in the Big 12 championship. we got to be emphatic about this, guys. We were all emphatic last year that K-State was going to the Big 12 championship. We manifested it. Let's do it again. K-State 10-2 and two, into the Big 12 championship they go. John Kurtz and I driving in the minivan in the Toyota Sienna with the wife and uh, Brody in the back, headed down for birthday weekend again. A new tradition for us. We'll head uh, for Brody's seventh birthday this year. We're going to head to Arlington again and uh, watch the Cats in another Big 12 championship. I think the roads are greased for Oklahoma to get there, uh, but I just I think Brent Venables is probably I, I can't get on board with it. So I think do think Case State gets enough help and. In a rematch with Texas in the Big 12 title game, I know Kurtz is not a big Texas supporter at this point. I do think Texas is probably for real this year. I think Texas gets K-State in a close one in a rematch, Charlotte. Well, honestly, unfortunately, the road is really greased for Texas and Oklahoma to meet in the Big 12 championship yeah. this year. Like that, I mean, we're being honest. Like that, that's what it is because of Oklahoma's schedule and because of Texas at all level. I mean, it's it's 100 percent there. Uh, that's the last thing any of us need. Uh, and I, I don't would not want to bet on Brent Venables or Texas football in general, but that would look like the most likely scenario. I actually think it's a really valid point that you guys bring up about Oklahoma and needing somebody probably to knock them off. I'm still going to, I'm still going to lean toward you guys can hate me if you want. I'm still going to lean toward just not quite getting into the big 12 championship game, uh, but being nine and three or 10 and two. So there you have it. Uh, it's at JL Kurtz on Twitter if you want to come after me. But if you do, you know, it'd be nice if you also subscribe to the Patreon, patreon.com slash 3 ma. Great way to support the pod if you love what we do. You also will just get extra content there. It's all bonus content, uh, including right now an update on K-State's situation with the Nike contract, the Nike Under Armour uh, debate going on right now there, or really just negotiation, which one is going to come through. Uh, we've got updates on basketball if you want to learn about Quez Glover, the newest commit. And if you want to learn about what K-State did in Israel and Abu Dhabi, we've got all that up on the Patreon page. You'll get Brody updates, chance to play us in College Pick'em. We'll have a Discord uh, coming soon, a, a group chat basically where you can communicate with us. $5 a month, patreon.com slash 3 maw. Thanks to our friends at Homefield, homefieldapparel.com. 3 maw 23 is the discount code there to get 15% off. And of course, Holiday Distillery, who provides you with Ben Holiday Bottled and Bond Bourbon and 360 Vodka. So make sure you go stock up, support those that support us. We appreciate all of you for listening. Until next time, we are talking game week, game week for football season. I am John Kurtz. For Derek Young and Coleman Mech, we're signing off. Thanks for listening to another three.